welcoming welcoming you to Beyond Design, Supporting Faculty with Online Teaching Principles. Thanks, Jillian. It's nice to be here. Hi, everyone. My name is Shannon Riggs, and I serve as the Executive Director of Academic Programs and Learning Innovation for Oregon State eCampus. We are in large um, online education provider with over 85 fully online degrees and programs and sir we served more than 26,000 students last year. Good afternoon everyone thanks for joining us I'm Catherine McAlvich. I am an assistant director of course development and training at Oregon State eCampus and I'm also faculty in the OSU graduate school. We're very excited to introduce you to our research based online teaching principles during this presentation. We'll also highlight how and why these principles might be a useful framework to consider adopting or adapting for your institution. Thanks, Catherine. Let's begin with a poll. We're going to use poll everywhere. Um, there are some directions up on the screen. Um, hopefully you're, you're familiar with this tool. Um, there are a few different ways to participate. I've unlocked it. And our question is, if we're wondering if those in our audience have standards, principles, or some other shared vocabulary for articulating what good online teaching looks like at your institution. Let's give everyone a moment to reply. Keep those responses coming. <laughs> All right. Looks like we've got a pretty good mix. Um, there are some who are still a few more rolling in, some who are using an external set of standards or principles, some that have an internal set of standards and some that are not using standards or principles yet. So um, hopefully um, you can find something, everyone can find something to, to take away from our presentation today. All right. All right, I thought I would start off with our, what we're calling our origin story. <laughs> Why did we feel it necessary to create online teaching principles as a resource? Well, it started when we were receiving requests from academic program leadership for help with criteria for online teaching evaluations and promotion packages. Sometimes we were working with supervisors who were in the position of evaluating online teaching, but maybe they didn't have very much or even any online teaching experience themselves. And so they just, they needed a resource to use to help them make um, um, to, to ground their, their evaluations in. We also had invested really heavily in course design support and training. We use a full service instructional design model at Oregon State. Uh, multi, we provide multimedia development services, faculty training that's required, um, but our support kind of dropped off once the course started being taught. Instructional designers were available for help, but there wasn't really anything formalized. And we are at QM Connect, so I do want to make sure that I share that we are a QM subscribing institution. And so all of our instructional designers receive, um, they complete at least the APP QMR, the Applying the QM Rubric training, and the PRC, the Peer Reviewer Certification training, at, at a minimum. Um, and our course design standards are heavily influenced by Quality Matters course design standards. Our faculty can choose to pursue QM training and course certification, and quite a few do, but it's not required for faculty. But even if our faculty that we're working with don't realize it, they are very well supported by Quality Matters course design standards. Um, and, and all of our courses are built with those standards in mind. But we realized that um, beyond the course design, we really needed some strong support uh, beyond that design phase so that faculty 
um, to support faculty as clearly in a research-based but flexible way throughout their teaching of the course. Um, so we wanted to just kind of continue that great support that we were receiving from Quality Matters and the design standards into the, the teaching of the course. Finally, because we've been offering online programs since 2002, uh, which I realize we're coming up on our 20th anniversary year pretty soon. <laughs> we had faculty who were at all experience levels, ranging from super experienced, they've been here since the beginning, all the way to brand new GTAs and instructors without much or maybe even any teaching experience at all. So we found that our new instructional faculty and GTAs really needed a tool that could paint a picture of what good online teaching looks like. And more experienced faculty needed a tool that they could use to help guide reflection on their own teaching practice as they strive to continually improve and grow. And we also wanted our principles to be very strongly rooted in best practices while also reflecting the demographics and needs of our online student population, which at eCampus tends to be non-traditional adults who are working, they might be raising and taking care of families, and they're definitely looking to be highly engaged in interactions with their peers and instructor and in course content. The idea then was to have a resource that speaks entirely to the actual facilitation of the course, so that it's also a helpful tool for, for faculty who teach courses that they didn't design and that they may or may not be able to make substantive changes to. So to develop the principles, we triangulated a couple of important themes, um, and you'll see these in just a moment when we share the principles, but these are the four sources that we kind of brought in information from as we developed this tool. So first we had the research. So we looked specifically at contemporary studies and literature that focus on teaching practice, practices of pedagogy and student success in the fully online asynchronous course environment as well as hybrids or blended courses, which I'll say a little bit more about in a bit. Second, we looked at annual student surveys of our OSU eCampus students, which surfaced both effective and ineffective online teaching principles. We wanted to help capture and encourage those effective practices that we were hearing about and ensure that these principles would help provide evidence for countering the ineffective practices that we hear about from our students. It's important to us to bring in the student voice too, so we can truly say that our principles were shaped by things that students have shared with us over the past few years. Third, we reviewed nominations for our annual online teaching awards. These nominations again come directly from our eCampus students and highlight exemplary teaching practices that enhance the online learning experience and that we want to disseminate and promote and see if we can get all faculty to do those things. And fourth, um, themes that my faculty support and training team encounters when we respond to student concerns about online courses, again, to help us shape these principles with an eye towards student success. So our goal was to make the principles concise and easy to digest. We aimed for no more than 10 principles and landed on 10 for online teaching and one additional principle specific to hybrid teaching. As I've mentioned, it was critical that these principles be evidence-based and that we be able to point faculty to a few key resources for further reading and exploration. So you'll see in just a moment that the principles themselves are accompanied by a bibliography where faculty can click through directly to permalinks in our OSU library system and get to those resources if they want to dig in. Finally, and very importantly, these principles need to be needed to be road tested by some of our own faculty to help promote buy in. Before the public release in January of this year, we partnered with faculty in our School of Psychological Sciences. These faculty were awesome to work with. They provided us feedback on the principles themselves, the wording of them, um, specifically to clarify them. And we also had a lot of conversations about how they could be used to plan for online teaching so we had a better sense of how to start distributing these. Faculty on our online education committee at OSU also provided comments used for final revisions. But of course, what we've re released so far is just version one. We anticipate that we'll make revisions as we receive additional feedback from faculty 
and as online education research just produces new insights into what online facilitation practices work best for our students. Okay, so I think we will invite you to go ahead and look at these principles. They are up on our website. You'll see that there's actually two different versions right on the website. There's a really nice accordion design for folks that want to just look at basically the HTML version. And then if you scroll to the bottom of that page, you'll see that there's downloadable um, versions as well of both the principles and the bibliography that accompanies them. And while you're getting there, I just wanted to say a little bit about the structure of them to help you navigate. So we modeled this, the structure of this resource after the QM rubric that's probably going to look familiar to those in our audience today. So there's a title for each, there's a brief description, and then what we're calling an annotation um, that explains some of the ways that the principle could be fulfilled. But of course, the examples there are not comprehensive. There's lots of different ways that faculty could meet if you will, each of these principles. But we tried to keep the resource very brief on purpose so that it's helpful as a kind of a tool and a resource and it's flexible. So Shannon and I are gonna spend the next few minutes expanding on each of the principles to give you a little bit better sense of what we're hoping to communicate to faculty when we talk about and use these um, principles in professional development. All right. So I know it's, you're probably perusing, but I'll just start from the top. So at the top of this list is stay current. Um, it's also worth noting that we didn't list the principles in what we considered to be order of importance. That would have actually been really challenging because all of these are really important, right? We boil them down to our 10. So one of the things you'll see in terms of the structure here is that some of these early principles in the list prompt instructors to think kind of in chronological order about preparing a course for publication before students even get into the course site at the beginning of the term. So this first principle is a call to ensure that course content is up to date, that it's functional, that it's published on time, because we know that online students will immediately encounter barriers and get frustrated if internal and external links are out of date or if the course isn't published on time, for example. The second principle, encourage equity, is a reminder of the students we are serving, who, as I mentioned before, are largely non-traditional adult students with diverse work and life experiences and equally diverse needs. Again, this is one of those principles to be considered before the term starts, but also as it gets underway. And we're encouraging faculty to clearly state and use policies that will support our students. So in the annotations here, you're going to see a number of those examples I mentioned of how faculty might do this. One important one that I'll just mention as an example here is to allow late work, even if just for partial credit. So we've heard of two issues in our courses sometimes that we want to help instructors avoid. First, some of our faculty traditionally haven't allowed late work, and our students count on the ability to turn and work a little late for a deduction as they make really hard choices about how to manage all of their complex life, work, personal responsibilities. The second piece we're trying to get at here is that some instructors allow late work, but don't necessarily state that. And that doesn't help our students out. It causes a lot of anxiety. So we're you know, talking both about the equity of the policies themselves and also that transparency to make sure that students know what is and isn't possible in a course. Thanks, Catherine. I just popped in the chat that the um, allowing late work is something that Michelle Kapiansky Brock mentioned this morning in the keynote address as well. So for those who've been present all day, that's the second time today, at least, that you're hearing that idea. Um, our next um, our next principle is to communicate clearly and quickly. So what's behind this is that when we're online, we kind of expect things to be instantaneous. You know, you click a button and you get the result. Online students may have some similar expectations, not exactly, but similar expectations for quick responses from instructors. Also, you know, students on campus know that they'll be able to catch their instructor just before or after class or in their office. 
online with no synchronous meetings, it's, it can be difficult to know when you can reach the instructor. And when students post a question, and then sometimes they'll, be, they'll keep checking back to see if it's been answered yet. And that can get frustrating, especially if they aren't sure how long an instructor is going to take to get back to them, or if they're waiting for an answer in order to complete an assignment. So one of our principles is to communicate clearly and quickly. Our policy is for instructors to respond to email or questions within 24 hours on business days. And we also encourage faculty to post their communication plans in their syllabi. Let students know the best ways to contact them and how long to expect to wait for a response. Now, it's also important to keep in mind the pace and the structure of the course. There are times when, as a faculty member, you'll need to be more available, such as in, uh, you know, around the times when high stakes assignments are due. And there are other times when it's okay to be a little quieter. And because online courses are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including weekends, faculty should be clear about weekends and their availability, and, and they should align their deadlines with their availability. So in other words, we advise faculty not to make assignments due on a Sunday night if they're going to be offline every weekend. Uh, you know, instead, they might consider making the assignments due on Monday evening when they'll be available for those last minute but important questions. Along the same lines, one of our principles is about providing notice to students when something changes or something unexpected comes up. And that will, even in an online course that's been designed and developed in advance of its delivery. If you have a storm or a fire or an illness comes up or one of the many other crazy things that, hap that has happened in the world in the last couple of years, you know, we all know that things come up. Um, but if, if something comes up that requires a change in your course schedule or your timeline for responding to students, we really recommend that faculty let students know as soon as possible that something has changed. We've talked quite a bit already about timeliness and that is really important. Um, and providing, you know, providing grades in a timely manner is especially important. You know, especially if your feedback is going to impact the student's progress in the course or the next steps in, a, in an assignment. But what's just as important with this principle as timeliness is providing meaningful feedback. So feedback needs to be substantive and helpful. We, we know saying good job, it might feel good in the moment, but it isn't really helpful for, <laughs> for students. Um, one thing, uh, our student success team at eCampus at Oregon State um, does an annual student survey. And every single year, our students rate interaction with the faculty member as the single most important thing affecting their satisfaction with the class and their, and their learning. So year in and year out, they rate that as the number one most important thing. Also interesting, this year we asked our students how they defined student success. And their number one definition of success is mastering course content, not grades, um, not, you know, not something else that you might expect, but actually mastering the content. So they want to know that they're getting it by making your feedback timely, but also substantive and meaningful. That's a great way to let students know what they're getting and what they might be missing. Just like Shannon said, we're we're very aware from the student survey data that we've been mentioning about where our students place the more the most value in terms of all the possible kind of points of interaction in an online course. And that faculty interaction is really, really critical, which ties in nicely here to the next principle, be present. As I'm sure members of our audience are aware, there's also a large body of research showing that instructor presence is key to both online student success and satisfaction. So it's not just something our eCampus students tell us this is pretty widely applicable across online students um, in the US at least. So in this principle, we're calling out that there are a few key methods in demonstrating presence, namely by making good use of tools in the learning management system, encouraging active learning by communicating effectively and consistency, by motivating students to be participants in their own learning. 
One of the things we hear from our eCampus students too um, is how effective um, course announcements can be when faculty are really taking or using the, those, that tool um, sort of to its best use. Um, so one thing we hear too is that our students are super savvy and they notice when there's canned announcements in the course. Maybe that content is extremely generic or it's posted at the exact same time every week, like we have faculty who might post an announcement at 8 a.m. every Monday morning, well-intentioned because that's when they think the week kicks off, but students start to notice, oh, that seems a little automated. I don't know if there's really a real person to, behind that announcement that's deploying it right so when we see faculty personalize announcements to basically get you know into detail about what's going on with that particular group of students that can be really effective we see faculty um, use this tool as a way to give broadly relevant feedback to the group to the course maybe help students to make connections across modules or weeks that may not be obvious to students or otherwise just demonstrate that the faculty is really engaged and paying close attention to what's going on in that online classroom space. And we know that students really appreciate that because it feels like that faculty is present and in a way that's actually visible in the LMS to students, right? Presence is also something that's entirely within the control of each instructor who teaches online. So this is one of those principles that's not really dependent on course design. This is something where even faculty who are teaching a course that they didn't design usually have quite a bit of latitude. And then a related principle, one that's closely intertwined with Be Present is foster community. Um, so again, we have in mind here some of those faculty who didn't design that course, but they're going to teach it. They need to be active participants in that course, no matter what the course design and content is. Um, so one aspect of facilitation that we're trying to emphasize heavily here is participation in online discussions. In years past, some of our faculty have seen that discussion space as kind of a student only space. But we know that discussions are more engaging and productive for students when their faculty, who's also the subject matter expert in the room, right, is in there helping those discussions along. So we talk with faculty a lot about different facilitation roles they can play to help make discussions effective, um, not least of which is trying to create that sense of community among the learners in the course. So maybe instead of just replying to each student individually, they're referring back to what other students have said or other examples that other students have posted within that thread to make it feel more like a community of people talking to each other. The supporting students is another one of our online teaching principles. And, and what we mean here is communicating in a supportive manner. Just like when we're speaking um, in person, in writing, the tone of voice really does matter. At our institution, our online learners tend to be working adults who stopped out of college at one point and are now back to complete their degrees. So these students may have had some negative feedback in the past. They may have had some academic struggles or they simply just might feel like they've been out of school for a long time and they're worried that they're not gonna be able to keep up. So being supportive and welcoming to those students and, and helping them adopt a growth mindset is really important. Helping them to identify their strengths as well as where they need to improve can really help create a sense of belonging. And uh, another of our principles is to reach out and refer. So just as you might note who is attending an on-campus class, you'll want to keep an eye on your learning management system to see if there are students who are not participating or who haven't logged in or who maybe missed an early assignment or deadline. And at that point, it's really important to warmly reach out and be inviting and let students know that it's not too late to catch up um, and try to connect with them. And then when you do connect with them, if you find that they need some extra help beyond your class, it's important to know which resources are available and refer students to those resources as needed. So that could include tutoring or success coaching that might help with time management skills, 
It could be something like mental health resources, financial aid or hardship grants, or maybe a human services resource center where they could borrow a textbook or um, a food pantry. Um, these will all vary based upon your institution, but the idea is to know which resources are available for your students so that you can help them access those resources that they need so that they can be successful in your class. And for cultivate inclusion, this is a big one and the one that we've started putting a lot of emphasis on in terms of the trainings that we offer to support these principles, which I'll say a little bit more about in a bit as well. We know that our online student population at OSU is more diverse than our on-campus student population in a number of ways. So what we're getting at with this principle is trying to highlight the need for online faculty to implement evidence-based principles and practices for inclusion in that online environment. We don't really mean diversifying the curriculum here, though we advocate for and support faculty in those efforts when they develop or redevelop or continually improve their courses. But again, what we're talking about is what happens during the course. So this is where we're getting into a focus on the relational aspects of online teaching, like getting to know students, building relationships with them, and supporting them with equity in mind along their learning journey during that term. One important strategy that we call out in the annotation is encouraging students who may feel like they don't belong in the higher education community, whether that be because they have one or more marginalized identities that they don't often see represented in higher ed, because someone has told them somewhere along the way that they don't have what it takes to be a successful college student, or maybe they just have persistent self-doubts about their academic abilities. So we're encouraging faculty to use a wide variety of tools, um, including tools in the LMS, strategies like outreach and giving good feedback that are mentioned in other principles, kind of bringing those all together under the umbrella of cultivating an inclusive learning environment. We also in would include things here like high impact practices um, known for helping diverse students like transparent assessment design, increasing mechanisms for feedback from students getting feedback from them as well. And last but certainly not least, so we've made it through all of our, our principles specific to online learning. This is the one for blended or hybrid learning. Ecampus offers select programs in a hybrid modality, so we wanted to be sure to represent, even if it's just at a high level, a key component of effective hybrid teaching, which is to explicitly and intentionally draw connections between in-class or synchronous learning and online or asynchronous learning. Those of you in our audience today that work in the blended or hybrid learning space know that this principle is actually really challenging to implement, right? This is not an easy one, just it looks like it might be easy, but really it's not. Um, and it's particularly, I think, challenging to help students see how to connect or what the connections are between the pieces of the course, as well as how a hybrid or blended modality changes how students may need to approach things like preparing for the in-class session, whether that's face-to-face -face or through a tool like Zoom. So much of this work of kind of drawing these intentional connections happens during the term. It's going to look a little bit different from term to term and group of student to group of student. So this is very squarely in that phase of facilitation that we wanted to cover with our online teaching principles. All right, let's, um, let's do another poll. Which, now that you've, you've had a chance to peruse and, and you've heard us kind of talk through the online teaching principles, we're curious to know which online teaching principle stands out most to you as, uh, stands out most to you as being important, either for your own course or helping faculty at your institution think about their teaching. And this is a free response question. So feel free to use a few keywords or the actual title of the principle as you get them pulled up. You're gonna see a word cloud start to be generated here. So we'll be able to pull out some of the key themes that are resonating with this group. 
Yeah. I see one in the chat too, committing to timeliness. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Being present, that seems to top the list. And that, that is certainly in line with our student survey, that, that contact with that instructor and that feeling of presence. And on the faculty side, one of the perhaps most challenging of these 10, not that any of these are necessarily easy, mm -hmm. especially for new faculty, but presence can be very different in different disciplines and different types of courses. And it certainly takes a lot of time and really thoughtful attention to a course, which especially in times like a pandemic has been really challenging for faculty to implement. Uh, and, and I think we found, Catherine, I think you would agree that we found it useful to um, share this with some faculty who may not have any experience with online education previously, even as a student. And so sometimes faculty will, will come into an online, you know, getting ready to be online and uh, teaching, and they will think that they're like creating a website that's just going to kind of run itself. <laughs> and so really emphasizing this form of presence is, um, and, and how important it is to be present in the many ways that they can be present in the class is really, really important. Absolutely. I, I try every time I can to contradict that it's not a crock pot where you set it and forget it, right? Um, and really trying to play up with faculty that this is the best part, at least in my own, I usually speak from my own experience having taught on campus and online. I love teaching online because the course is mostly ready to go before the term begins. And so that's where you get to spend your time during the actual term is working with those students, getting to know them, trying to help them along. Um, and so that that's the fun piece for a lot of folks about teaching online. Yeah. And, you know, looking at this word cloud, I'm, I'm just struck by how there's really not much here or anything really that's about technology, <laughs> oh, which is interesting is a lot of times when people are first learning about online education, they, they go right to the technology piece. How does it work? You know, how do I set this setting? This is all about the human interactions that that happen in, in online teaching, which again is very much like the the um, the keynote that we heard this morning. So that's great. All right, let's let's move on from here, and let's talk a little bit about how we are using the principles and how you can use them too. Um, Basically, we have made this tool uh, openly available with a Creative Commons license to encourage and encourage you and to help make it easy for other institutions to adopt them. We knew that we had we felt really supported by the, the Quality Matters course design standards. But when we looked for um, some teaching standards or teaching principles that would provide that kind of structure, we had trouble finding it. So we wanted to make this available for others um, in case they were having the same kind of struggle. So um, we'd like to share a few different ways that we are using this tool. Um, one way is uh, we're using this tool with faculty who are doing peer reviews of each other's teaching. Um, our online psychology program has adopted them as part of their peer review process. And these are, um, the principles are some concrete things for faculty to look for in each other's online teaching, aside from the course design elements that we're so familiar with, with um, just with our instructional design and the, you know, what, what's actually in the course. We also reference online teaching principles in our check-in with academic program leads. And that helps us ensure that the administrators and instructional faculty and our staff have a common language and understanding of what good online teaching looks like. And as for those other four examples on the bottom half of the the slide, these are really all about faculty training and development, which is the area my team focuses on. So I'll speak a little more to those. Um, as we've implemented these, and as we pointed out earlier, they're still fairly new for us. We officially launched them with all of OSU in January, but we had been working with psychology faculty on them prior to that. But in this more general release phase, we've already seen these principles make a difference, both in preparing new faculty to teach online, and helping continuing faculty to improve their practices 
through a refresh training that we offer every quarter. Um, Shannon had mentioned earlier when we were talking about timeliness that that 24 hour response time on business days has always been a policy, but it was one that we'd actually struggled a bit to have faculty implement. And so there seemed to be a bit of a change between having it be a policy versus a principle where, where we could talk about why and how this is important to students and back that up with research. So now when we train new faculty, for example, they, they haven't really questioned that that's just the way that communication policies should work in their course. They seem to be much more willing to buy in because they know why from the outset. And it's not just kind of a rule that stands somewhere or on the book, so to speak, or on a website. So that's been really interesting to see. And I would say the same is, is holding true with many of the other principles too, that we're just, we're laying them out in a much more clear and transparent and more digestible way for new folks. As well as for, you know, like I said, returning folks who want just another touch point to come back to and reevaluate their practice. So that said, our principles aren't intended to be a kind of one time checklist where faculty just say, yep, I'm doing some of these things, check it off, move on, right? But really as a framework for thinking further about and continually refining online teaching approaches and choices. So to that end, we've also mapped all of our faculty trainings, all of our professional development opportunities back to the principles. So let's say an instructor looks at these and says, wow, that cultivate inclusion principle looks really interesting. I'm not quite sure how that would work in my course. I say, great, we've got a foundational training on that and we can point them directly to a four week workshop that we have on inclusive teaching online. So this has been helpful kind of as a launching pad to help faculty identify points of interest where they'd like more professional development or if they're recognizing it as kind of more of a weakness in their approach to online teaching. We have you know, trainings and other opportunities to support them that we can point them right to. And then finally, I want to just comment on how important it has been to help our faculty connect teaching and course design choices as part of using this tool. So again, we really see our online teaching principles as a supplement to our use of the QM rubric because the QM rubric helps us get that course into shape. And now the principles can help us make sure and ensure quality in the actual delivery and facilitation of the course that the QM rubric doesn't really comment on. So I want to tell you a quick story. It's a recent one and a really encouraging one that came uh, through one of our instructional designers who was working with a psychology professor as part of our pilot. The psychology professor was planning out assessments in her online course thinking both about course design and how she would best be able to respond with individualized feedback to help students during the course. And so often when our instructional designers work with faculty, they're very focused on those design choices, but kind of miss the implications of those choices when they're actually going to teach the course or when they hand it off to a colleague who might teach that course. But by focusing on the principles, during the course development project, this particular faculty was able to make different choices because she could see, oh, this is, because I'm gonna make this kind of assessment design choice, I'm gonna to have to spend more time giving feedback. It's important that it be returned in five days or whatever the particular use case was because then students are gonna move on to this other piece of a staged or scaffolded assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so the faculty member did exactly what we were hoping for, which was thinking about the course design choices around assessment and the actual implementation of them and the feedback that comes with it as being totally interrelated. So uh, what we're hoping, and we haven't heard her report back yet, but what we're hoping to see is that she's actually more effective in teaching that course because it was designed with the teaching in mind. So a very cool but early example that I just wanted to mention. Catherine. All right, let's do another poll. Um, we would like to know how could the use of online teaching principles have a positive impact at your institution? Thanks for popping that link in the chat, Catherine. No problem. 
looks like we're having some good conversations. I wanted to make sure it was right there for everybody. Oh, consistency is a good one. This is one we're really hoping for as well. It gets back to what Shannon said earlier about having that common vocabulary that transcends discipline and types of courses. It's appropriate for undergrad and grad, right? All of our online faculty should be able to use them and try to implement them in a more consistent way. I love this compliment, the implementation of quality matters. Absolutely improving quality. Just improvement. Ooh, helping with faculty focus. That's a nice way to look at it. Short and to the point that, yeah, we really try to make things actionable for our faculty and make it easy. We provide the resources later on if they want to dig in deeper, but we try to give them little chunks that they can put to use right away. Student success, absolutely. <laughs> Help our administration realize that online courses are a good thing, absolutely. And that there's lots of research to support these, right? Well, it's not a gray area anymore about what it takes for online teaching to work. The, and this helps to lay out for program leads, administrators, folks who might be working at that level, what exactly needs to happen. And maybe professional development that faculty need to be supported in engaging in to help get them there. That's great. Thank you. Um, we would we have a few minutes left, and I we'd love to open it up for questions or or um, or comments. Please feel free to pop those in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself um, and and speak to the group, that's fine too. Yeah, and and while we're waiting for questions, I just wanted to go back to Christine shared out um, the national standards for quality online teaching that works for K twelve. This is something we looked at. This was one of the early things I found that we were hoping that there was a higher ed version of, and we didn't really see one that had been developed. But if there are K-12 folks in the room, it's a great resource and a very in-depth one that does these same sort of things. Yeah, I've seen uh, a couple of comments about just appreciation for the open license. We are big believers in open educational resources and openly sharing. So we were we were happy to do that. Oh, there's a request to repeat that for K-12. Yeah, Heather, let me just repaste this. I can't take credit for it. This is all Christine's doing, but this is what she had shared. Um, with the link to the basically a K-12 version of the same kind of resource that has been developed. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is endorsed by QM for K-12 as well. Great to see the positive feedback. Thank you all. And we just wanted to mention too, as, as you work with these, if you do adopt them or adapt them at your own institution, we'd love to hear about it. I mean, this many of these things as we've talked about, we wanted to make sure that we're suiting um, our online audience, our online students based on what we know about their demographics and their needs, for example. Uh, but this is something that can be shared more widely across institutions, I think, and that we could kind of work on all together. So if you have feedback or if you want to just let us know how they're being used, we'd love to have follow up and continue this conversation beyond today. We also welcome suggestions for improvement. So if you feel like you've you've got something that you're using that we've missed, we would love to hear that. And um, as Catherine mentioned earlier, this is our first version and we fully intend that we will need to update this over time. All right, I think we've addressed all questions unless-, unless Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Hi, this is Roz from Florida Southwestern. And, and I was thinking real quick before we hop off, you had mentioned the surveys that you're gathering a lot of this data with. And I'm wondering if you have anywhere that you um have published those survey questions and uh, something so that we can get an idea of how we might bring that back to our own institutions as well i'd love to learn 
about these things from our students? Good question. I don't have that link handy right now, but I know that we do make the survey results public each year. Um, so you, I'm sure that if you visited ecampus.org and state.edu and did a little search, you would be able to, to find them. And if not, please feel free to drop me an email. My, my email address is up on the screen and I'd be happy to follow up with you afterward. Yeah, and I'll just note too that we the student survey, we run it biannually with questions about course design and teaching specifically. And we've really over the past couple of years, especially as we've been working on this project with the principals, we've been trying to really closely align the questions that we're asking students to things we're working with faculty on on the principals so that we can see if we see some improvement because that's an important kind of evaluation piece um, as we work through um, this kind of project with the principals to see if what we're doing and how we're talking about these things actually works when it gets all the way down to the student experience. So we saw for the first time this last spring, for example, um, we've got some clear insight into whether or not these principles are working for students, and then we can make adjustments on the faculty training and professional development side. Thank you, Robert. You found the link already and popped it in the chat. Thanks. <laughs> That's great. Oh, done, Robert, because our search engine is not always the best on our website, so great job. <laughs> yeah, and that is an annual survey, but there's our different um, focuses each year. So I think we bounce back between like the teaching and learning and then student support services. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Any other last minute questions? If not, I think Jillian may have um, a closeout message for us. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. And thanks, Catherine, for your presentation. We'll go ahead and stop the recording now and thank everyone for attending.